There we go. All right. Uh, we good? Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'd like to call to order this independent school district 624. Uh, would the clerk please call the roll? Thompson. Absent. Arcane. Here. Malloyd. Absent. Chapman. Here. Ellison here. Mullen. Here. New master. Here. All right. Uh, although it's kind of weird uh, doing it over video chat, I think it's important that we uh, stand and recognize the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you would all please do so, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Wayne, do you want to lead us off? Sure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United, United States, States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, which it stands one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible with, liberty with liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. All right. Thank you all. I appreciate uh, the technology piece in that and uh, appreciate your effort there. Uh, before we get into the uh, asking, uh, talking about the agenda, uh, Dr. Kazmichek has a statement to read, so I would turn it over to him to read the statement. All right. Thank you, Chair Mullen. So due to the current federal and state emergency declarations and guidance about limiting person-to-person -person contact due to the COVID-19 pandemic, this meeting of the White Bear Lake Area School District School Board is being conducted in accordance with Minnesota statutes uh, 13D.021, meetings by telephone or other electronic means. Due to the health pandemic, the school board determined that it is not feasible for the school board members to be physically present at the regular meeting location and that it is not feasible for the public to attend this meeting at the regular meeting location due to the health pandemic. Persons may view the meeting on our website, isd624.org. School board members are reminded to mute their microphone when they are not speaking. School board members wishing to speak should use the chat feature and then wait to be recognized by uh, Chair Mullen. The chair will determine the order in which board members wishing to speak will be recognized. When recognized, the board members should unmute the microphone, speak, and then mute their device. All votes will be conducted by roll call. Each school board member should wait until their name is called before voting. This meeting is being recorded. Access to the recording will be made available on the dis school district's uh, website as soon as is reasonably possible. That's it. Thank you very much. I would also like to, just because it's electronic, I'd like to, I'd like the clerk to please note that Angela Thompson is now uh, in, the, in the meeting. Noted. Thank you. And uh, now we will move in. Uh, we have before us an agenda for tonight's meeting. I would ask for a motion to approve the agenda for tonight's meeting. So moved. Uh, motion by Mr. Chapman. Is there a second? Second. A second by Dr. Arcan. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, this will require a roll call. I would ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thompson. Aye. Arcan. Aye. Beloyd. Chapman. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Mullen. Aye. New Master. Aye. All right. We have before us an agenda. We also have before us a consent agenda, and these are our sundry items uh, that typically take place uh, during our board meeting. Um, the one thing that I continue to bring up because it's so important to our school district is the generosity of our community. And this month uh, is no different from not only uh, the generous donations to our student body, but also to the senior center. And I would just like to thank everyone for their generosity and thank them for their continued support of the school district. Uh, with that, I would ask for a motion to adopt the consent agenda. So moved. So moved. A motion by Ms. Ellison, was that you? Yes. And then a second by Dr. Newmaster? Yes. Okay. Uh, any other, uh, this will also require a roll call vote. Would the clerk, clerk please call the roll? Thompson? Aye. Arcan? Aye. Chapman? Aye. Ellison? Aye. Mullen? Aye. Sorry. 
New Aye. Mexico. Aye. All right. The motion uh, then passes, and we have before us a consent agenda. Thank you all. I know the technology is a little bit uh, uh, fussy sometimes, so I appreciate your patience. Uh, we are now at the portion of the meeting, uh, which is our public forum. During the time the school board in, is uh, meeting by electronic uh, means, those who would like to provide comments during the public forum may submit their comments using the White Bear Lake Area Schools Public Forum Comments Form. Um, Dr. Kazmichek, do we have any of those that have been submitted for tonight's meeting? Yes, we have one. And um, are you ready? Are you, yep, there you are. Yep. Yes, sir. Um, would you please read it? Sure. Um, we have, um, have one community member who has submitted um, by the name of Kara, I believe, Kara Peterson, K E R A, at the address of 353 West 7th Street, Suite 201 in St. Paul. Phone number 651-222-3787. Um, and the message is, Dear White Bear Lake Area School Board members, as president of the St. Paul Regional Labor Federation, I wanted to write and express appreciation to the White Bear Lake Area School Board for the action taken during its May 11, 2020 meeting to approve the use of prevailing wage on construction projects funded by the 2019 bond referendum and to expressly state that the use of prevailing wage on construction projects will continue to be the school district's practice on projects that are associated with the bond referendum. I also wanted to wanted you to know that I have heard from many community members and leaders about the school board's vote on a failed motion that would have allowed for a 30-day public comment period related to the use of a project labor agreement as well as the motion that explicitly stated that the school district would not enter into a project labor agreement for bond referendum projects. Community members expressed that they felt the school board's process was not transparent and that they were shut out in this process, even though they live in the district, have children in the schools and were active in helping to pass the referendum. I share these concerns as my efforts to connect with school board members and with Dr. Kazmierczak via phone and email to discuss the use of a project labor agreement were left unanswered. More than 6,000 union members and householders of unions affiliated with the St. Paul Labor, sorry, St. Paul Regional Labor Federation live in the White Bear Lake Area School District. I'm writing on their behalf to request that the White Bear Lake Area School Board establish a prevailing wage policy with strong enforcement mechanisms and that the school board monitor district administration's enforcement efforts to ensure that the prevailing wage policy is applied in a fair and equitable manner. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Vetti. Is there any other uh, public comments? Okay, seeing or hearing none, uh, we will move into our first informational item, C1, which is the update on the summer programming. Uh, Dr. K, is this you? I will turn it over to um, Mr. Maurer. Are you, are you gonna kick it, kick it off? Yep, I am. Okay, great. So yeah, good evening, Chair uh, Mullen, members of the board, Dr. Kazmichek, and uh, fellow people in attendance of the meeting on this warm, balmy Monday evening. But uh, yeah, just looking to forward to providing an update um, for everyone on what's going to what's going to be happening this summer. I have a brief overview of uh, things related within community services and recreation around some adult and youth activities and how things are going to look a little different this summer, um, and then some uh, some current data that we have on some numbers, and then. I also have Brian Pelican here to provide an update on uh, some summer high school activities going on. And then Seth Salinger, who is overseeing our um, high school, uh, summer school and credit recovery program is here to provide a brief update on that as well. So I'm gonna jump in and kick it off uh, right away in the area of uh, community services and rec. And um, so what's happening this summer for youth, uh, for an overview within our early childhood department are getting ready for kindergarten programs that we offer for our preschool students that will be going into kindergarten have been pushed back. Um, we were going to start some in June, and then in July, we pushed everything back until July. Um, those sections will start then. It gives those students an opportunity for them to participate in some programming uh, for a week at the school that they will be attending for for kindergarten. It gives them time to meet their principal, uh, be, get comfortable with the building and their, and their upcoming surroundings for kindergarten. Uh, our summer extended day and flex uh, school age care programs uh, will be taking place as well, and I'll provide a little bit more detail about how that's going to look differently a little bit this summer, uh, a little bit later on. 
our youth enrichment programs will run. Um, we will continue some virtual program offerings as well as some take-home kits. We've had uh, projects and, and things through vendors that kids and families can sign up for to take home um, and pick up and then gives them an opportunity to do a project at home with their parents or something uh, to explore their interests in, in those take-home kits. Our driver's ed program continues. Um, and we will also be having some in-person uh, robotics and arts enrichment as we have in the past. And those will all take place in one location this summer uh, over at Otter Lake Elementary. As far as summer sports camps go, um, currently we are starting uh, next week um, on the 15th, the week of the 15th. We will be operating a outdoor uh, tennis camp at North Campus. Our boys and girls basketball camps at uh, North and South Campus will run. However, they will be modified to fit those, the guidelines and uh, new standards that I'll talk about briefly on the next slide, uh, as well as our uh, volleyball camp at Sunrise Middle School will start next week as well. Uh, our Summer U program, which is our summer school program for our elementary and middle school students uh, will run. Um, we've been given new guidance um, before the school year ended that provide uh, an improved or uh, provided an, an approved in-person and distance learning models. As you are all very well aware, we ended the school year with a distance learning model um, and we're giving um, approval with guidance on how to operate that in person as well. Um, we are taking a, a little bit of a breather on that and gonna push things back a little bit this summer. So we have a planning team that's been working on this as we've been receiving new guidance from the state about how this can look. And we will re be reconvening here in the next couple of weeks uh, to determine our best approach as a district to offer opportunities for um, continued uh, learning for students over the summer. And those programs will likely be offered starting in late July and then end in early August, giving students an experience to um, uh, participate in those opportunities for uh, continued learning over the summer while also giving them another continued break before we start up school again uh, later in the fall. As far as uh, opportunities for adults, all our uh, adult enrichment program will continue to offer online enrichment opportunities. Uh, we've been exploring and offering those um, since the pandemic happened um, and we will continue to offer online only. Right now we do not have set plans to bring adults back in the buildings at this time for classes. So we've uh, um, been offering any opportunities that we can with our vendors and, and teachers for uh, online enrichment opportunities for our interested adult population. Our senior programming, um, our senior center officially is still closed um, to the public. We are unable to offer programs through there at this time uh, like we normally have uh, over the summer uh, months. Our Meals on Wheels program continues. Um, since the pandemic hit uh, hard in mid-March, we have actually taken on an additional 120 new, uh, what, what Metro Meals on Wheels and Meals on Wheels are calling is uh, our COVID clients, our people that may have been experiencing more difficulty uh, obtaining food and maybe ex be experiencing a little more vulnerability in that area. Uh, we've taken on 100 new, uh, 120 new people since then. So it's been a great service. We've been able to uh, provide uh, a huge thank you to those operating the uh, Meals on Wheels program, as well as the Senior Center, and a huge thank you to all of our volunteer drivers that we have from the community that come in to help provide these meals to our families. Uh, and we also are looking to offer continued virtual connections to our seniors. Um, Another update that came in uh, too late to put on the slide. Um, we're also working to offer our um, senior foot care opportunities for those that need it. Um, we've come to find that it is a particularly uh, 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 important health need that we were able to provide. And it's, it's been very difficult for them to find those services any, uh, anywhere else outside of the senior center. Um, and we are working uh, diligently with a new vendor to come in to follow the uh, new guidelines in place. And we look to start offering that again uh, uh, in person at set times uh, starting next week as well. Um, our adult basic education program continues. We've transitioned into a distance learning model for our adult learners as well. Uh, that model of distance learning will remain to stay in place throughout the summer. Um, we have been also given permission to run a hybrid model uh, to offer in-person classes and we do hope to uh, continue to explore that and hope to bring our adult students back into classrooms when we're able to, uh, hopefully later this summer, sometime in July or early August. Uh, as far, and then just an update around uh, facility use. So right now, uh, starting June 1, we did begin to take outdoor reservations for facility use for those uh, groups or organizations that were able to provide uh, uh, an MDH uh, summer programming um, return to play plan. 
which we've been asked to provide and have set for all of our programs. So we're, we ask this of our outside renters as well. And I'll uh, dive into a little bit more about what that looks like on the next slide. Um, currently, we do not have any set date uh, to allow for um, in, uh, indoor facility rentals, uh, but we continue to monitor that and then um, we'll determine um, when's the best date to do so uh, as we navigate through the summer. And so just to what, how things will look a little different this summer, um, what people can expect to see in all of our programs is that all of our programs have been adapted to meet the new Minnesota Department of Health social distancing guidelines. Uh, and what that means um, is that when people enter our, into our buildings, they will expect to uh, undergo a daily health screening procedure and check-in process upon entering our buildings or attending our outdoor camps and programming. Uh, what that looks like is they'll have a specific entry and exit uh, for all of our programs and all of our buildings um, and, and pr specific procedures for drop-off and pickup. Um, which could be screening and asking uh, parents of kids and other kids joining high school programs. There's a series of questions that MDH asks us to um, uh, ask them to confirm uh, before they enter the before they enter the program or classroom. Uh, and this also will help with our uh, contact tracing protocols. If if somebody were to uh, become sick uh, in our programs or get uh, a confirmed case of COVID. Uh, 19, then we will be able to track that, um, who they were um, in contact with in their groups. Our group sizes for all of our summer programs will be limited to a one to nine ratio. Um, so all of our uh, summer camps and uh, like basketball camps will be a one to nine. We can have up to nine students and a coach on one basketball court um, on each half. Uh, same for volleyball. Our outdoor guidance was the same. However, our uh, the recent update from the state on Friday showed us that our, our um, they shared with us that our outdoor um, <clears throat> uh, sports camps um, or anything outdoor can be increased up to 25 people. Um, so that was a nice um, update for us as we look to continue things over the summer. Um, as far as our extended day program, so what's that? What, how that how that looks a little bit different with our one to nine ratio is that um, students historically have been given the uh, what we call like student voice and choice. Students have a lot of options throughout their day and extended day and flex to to explore whatever interest they want to see, um, different activities going on, different options for them to choose. And so they would be with a bunch of different teachers throughout the day providing different enrichment activities or um, different uh, activities outside. What this looks like this year for this summer is that if I were a um, class lead or a, a extended day uh, supervisor or um, aide or assistant is that I would have a group of nine students and those nine students would be with me all summer. We would have one classroom, all of our activities and um, would, uh, would be in that classroom just to limit um, the uh, exposure to kids throughout the day. So not, not the most ideal uh, program like we're used to running it, but uh, given the guidelines that are in place, uh, we're very confident that uh, we're able to offer a quality program for kids to participate and we have a safe space for them to do so. Um, and what that looks like too during the day is that we have staggered space transition times, meaning that if students are going down for lunch, not everybody's going down at once. Um, students will be released at specific times, so they're the only ones in the hallway. And again, limiting that interaction uh, with other students in the program uh, uh, for their safety and health uh, throughout the day. Uh, regular hand washing um, uh, uh, throughout the day, and then updated cleaning and sanitizing procedures in our buildings as well. Um, our extended day and flex sites, uh, you know, traditionally in the summer, we would offer three uh, three extended day sites and one middle school site. Um, due to our ratios and the number of students we have in our programs, um, how that looks this year, and you can see in the slides there, is that uh, we'll have five sites and our flex sites will be combined uh, with our um, extended day sites in one location. So we will try to make sure that uh, students or our families that have students both at elementary and middle school will be in one building uh, for their programming. So. Um, you can read the, the grades options uh, through there on that slide. Um, the next slide on participation data, it's not exactly apples to apples, given that the numbers of from 2019 are uh, year end and we are in the very beginning parts of the summer, obviously for this year, but it does, the uh, extended days uh, numbers kind of do speak for themselves in terms of how uh, COVID-19 will, will likely affect us this summer. Um, we continue to accept contracts throughout the summer as, as we are able to given staff and ratios. Uh, but you can see is where we ended last year with uh, 474 contracts in extended day and 159 in flex. Uh, currently, we are at uh, just just under 350 contracts for extended day and 
uh, just over 50 contracts for Flex. We had uh, from our the time when our extended day registration began to now, uh, we have had 243 participants withdraw due to COVID-related reasons. And that could be a number of things, um, uh, just parents not comfortable bringing their kids into programming yet. Uh, we've had a number of calls of parents that are, unfortunately have been furloughed from their positions and just started in need of the care this summer. Um, so a lot of reasons due to that. And if as things, um, you know, as the dial slowly changes uh, in the direction we'd like to see it go, we hope to have those numbers go up and and provide that service to those families that are in need. Uh, and again, the youth enrichment and summer camp participation, obviously our numbers are lower, but we're in the early parts of the summer, but we do expect our numbers to be lower um, this summer, given everything going on. There are some camps, uh, wrestling camp, cheer camp, um, those camps that are more uh, more difficult to socially distance and offer um, um, that kind of safety we have chosen to cancel. And one thing oh, I forgot to note on the summer camps is that all of our sports camps are contactless uh, per the guidance. So um, uh, participants in our camps are expected to be socially distanced. Uh, the programming involved will be a lot of skills and drills. Uh, we are not allowed to play games or have competitions at this point. Um, uh, but um, for, I'm uh, sorry, for, yeah, not expected to have games until later this summer um, when they move into that mid or medium or high risk sports as they transition for the summer. Um, and then I'll uh, hand it off to Mr. Pelican here for an update around some summer high school opportunities. Uh, thank you, Mr. Maurer. Uh, good evening, Chair Mullen, school board, Dr. Kazmerchuk and cabinet. Thanks for having me tonight uh, to talk just a little bit about high school activities in the summer. Uh, I would like to begin by just simply stating that my office and, and Tim Maurer's office have, have worked hand in hand over the last couple of months just making sure that we are all on the same page and we are following the MDH and the CDC guidelines regarding our activities. They are ever changing. Uh, we've been hit with several curveballs, including a couple that Tim has already spoken about regarding uh, a positive one and an increase in our outdoor capacity. Uh, there's another curveball that I'm going to talk about regarding pools here on, the, on my next slide. Uh, to not be completely redundant, please know that all of those restrictions and all of those those guidelines that are in place for Tim's programming do hold through all the way through the high school. And so if you look on my slide, the two main things that I'm working with are summer practices and summer strength and conditioning. Many of our programs who run youth camps always run them through community ed. And so that works under Tim's rather than mine. I'm talking specifically our high school coaches working with our high school student athletes. So those are the, those are the two main things uh, that are under my umbrella this summer that I'm working on. Uh, programming starts just like Tim's uh, next Monday, and, and we kind of base that off of the State High School League summer waiver for our head coaches got pushed back to help with planning to the 15th. So all of those things are starting up next Monday. Uh, we are going to have consistent protocols, like I said, with Community Ed. Our forms are very similar. Our waivers are very similar. Just simply some name name changes, and I appreciate Community Ed for all their work on those on those forms. Tim and his staff did an amazing job getting those things together and making sure that we were working together in lockstep in our communication. From a summer practices standpoint, our coaches are working with their current athletes. They will be following the MDH and the CDC guidelines. Our practices are contactless, so they're all individual drills. Uh, you'll see on, on the few, next slide that there are several sports that by the very nature of their sport can't be practicing at all this summer. We're hoping maybe down the road in late summer we'll get to it. And also currently um, all youth organizations, MDH and CDC, are limiting to no game. So there are no contests, no leagues running this summer. Uh, as far as summer strength and conditioning is concerned, we have a third party ETS who runs that for us. They run it year round. Um, they're a growing organization that is owned by Ryan Engelbert, who is a local guy. Um, and also Adam Thielen is co-owner of it. They've been working with us uh, for a year now. They have several locations throughout the Metro and work with almost 20 high schools in the Metro now on their strength and conditioning. Because they are their own gym and they run our program, uh, I have allowed them to just implement and utilize their protocols and their guidelines. And because they are a private gym, much like Lifetime, much like the YMCA and those other private gyms, they are following much stricter guidelines than we even are dealing with. And so I'm confident uh, with what I've experienced and what I've seen from them that they are going to do great things. 
We currently have more kids signed up at this point for summer training this summer than we did last summer, which is approximately 200 kids that we will be starting on the turf with because we will not be starting in our weight room um, due to COVID and just making sure that, that we're trying to follow the guidelines as much as we can. So we're staying away from the weight room to start with, hoping that we can get there at some point. And so we will be spending our days out on the turf uh, and we will be getting creative in spaces in the building um, on bad weather days. And so if you look at uh, the next slide, which is up, um, the sports that we are not dealing with, unfortunately, for a couple of different reasons that can't go at all, uh, are, are sports like football and wrestling. Tim talked about cheer. Those, those sports that are have contact specific to them. Um, football, not you can do individual drills in football, but that's more due to basically the sheer numbers. And hopefully with it continuing to increase with our numbers, it will be easier for them maybe down later in the summer to get to drills. But football is currently not going. Wrestling is currently not going because they're just the basis of the game and the sport doesn't allow us to be very effective with no contact with sanitizing. And then there's also sports where we just, due to facilities limitations, are not allowed to be in there. The two main ones that we're dealing with right now are boys hockey because Ramsey County had shut down all of their arenas. Um, and then the one that was the curveball that just got thrown at us uh, after this slide was put together was swim and dive because of the YMCA. I do have a meeting set uh, with the YMCA to talk about what the summer looks like as well as what the fall is going to look like for them from a pool standpoint. We actually had a meeting set for this afternoon, so I was hopeful I was going to be able to have some updated information for you. But as you know, with, with the update to pools being open at 50% capacity, uh, the folks at the YMCA sent us an email and said, hey, can we postpone? We just got a lot going on right now. And so I'm hopeful that at some point this summer we'll have some updated information for you regarding our partnership with the YMCA and our, our sports, our swim and dive that work through there. But all in all, we're trying to maintain as much as we can and try to get our student athletes out, um, being active at least, working really hard to stay under the MDH and the CDC guidelines with the same entrance and exit and, and going through the symptoms and, and hopeful we get through this summer. And it's a positive experience for all our kids and we don't knock on wood, run into any issues where we have to shut down. That's all I have. I think I'm turning it over to Seth, unless somebody's got a question. Thank you, Mr. Maurer, Mr. Pelequin. Is there, are there any questions for Mr. Maurer, Mr. Pelequin? And I think there's one slide that I'm going to touch on real quick in Mr. Wald's absence, and then it's all uh, then it's going to be all Mr. Salinger here to wrap it up. Okay. But I think the next slide is the summer meal program. So Mr. Wald uh, wasn't able to be in attendance tonight, so I told him I would speak to this for him on his behalf. Uh, just an update on the summer meal program. Um, our summer meal pro program will continue on Wednesdays through the month of June. Uh, each meal bag will contain at least five breakfasts and five lunches. There is no sign up required uh, prior to so, and the pickup locations are listed as below. Uh, school side pickup locations um, uh, Wednesdays uh, from 9.30 to 10.30 in the morning will be uh, Onika, Otter, and Willow Lane Elementaries. And then uh, Wednesdays in June from 8.45, um, sorry, neighborhood pickup, neighborhood meal pickup locations. Uh, Wednesdays in June from 8.45 to 9.45 in the morning. Uh, the addresses are listed below uh, on the slide for locations in Hugo, Maplewood, Badness Heights, and uh, four addresses in White Bear Lake as well. Um, so I um, just told him I'd share that with you guys. If you have specific questions, I don't know if I'd be the one to answer those right now, but we can definitely um, get answers to any questions you may have and uh, have Tim or uh, Miss Bridget Lane uh, reach back to you. Thank you guys very much. Are yep. there any questions for on any of the information that was covered so far? All right. I just want to compliment you both on your work and thank you very much, uh, especially around the health and safety stuff uh, for uh, a lot of different reasons. So thank you both very much. You're welcome. All right, Mr. Uh, do you want to provide your update on secondary or, or high school? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Chair Mullen, um, School Board, Dr. Kazmierczak and Cap Cabinet for having me. Um, we made the decision for summer school to do distance learning again. Um, we added a couple different um, things that we were going to do as opposed to what was being done during the school year. Um, we heard from students that they needed that contact with teachers and other classmates. So we implemented 
30 minute Google Meets um, for each of the three classes that students are gonna be taking. So students are connecting with teachers at 9, 9.30 and 10. And then there's a work seminar class for students at 10.30 um, to earn elective credit for having a job or looking for a job and to gain some um, job skills and, and interviewing skills and resume building skills. Um, we're using this time to connect with the students, um, to give instructions, uh, answer any pressing questions, and then we get to take real-time attendance, which then allows counselors, myself, um, and some other student support staff to be reaching out to students and families to make sure that they are attending summer school and getting their work done for the credit recovery. Um, we've been really lucky to be able to provide uh, either a para or a promise fellow to each teacher within their classrooms to help provide that student support. So paras and um, Promise Fellows are holding sort of office hours for students to be able to check in with them and get additional one-on-one -on -one help um, over Google Meets with them. Um, and that's being done in each and every one of the classes that they're, they're currently taking. Um, technology, so thank you, Steve and Sarah Florin, um, have been amazing to work with on providing um, technology for kids over the summer, allowing students at North, South, and ALC to keep their Chromebooks so there wasn't a large scale rollout of technology to students and we were able to keep keep it contactless uh, during this time frame. They also have continued uh, wireless hotspots for students who didn't necessarily have um, wireless access at their house. So all students in summer school have the technology that they need. They're also then providing technology support um, for staff and students during this time as well. Um, we are also lucky to have an EL teacher, SPED teacher, chemical health teacher available for students during this time. Um, they are still holding uh, group meetings for our students at Insight to make sure that um, they have the support needed to remain um, chemical free. Um, we have several EL students enrolled and we have an EL teacher providing services for those students to make sure that they have access um, and equity for all the things that they they need um, for special education, or I'm sorry, for uh, English learning services. Can I go to the next slide or does that have to be done by somebody else? Oh, thank you very much, whoever did that. Um, summer school's first day was, was today. Um, it was a long day. I will tell you that I am still um, getting emails from students regist registering for summer school now, um, which we're registering them and getting them in classes as soon as possible. So um, that, that was great. Uh, it's gonna run Monday through Friday uh, for 15 days. So June 8th to June 26th. Um, when Marissa asked if anything was gonna change on the slide, I said, no, some of these numbers have changed pretty dramatically. Um, we have had over 450 students initially referred for summer school. Um, so between when I put this together and today, we've had 100 extra students referred for summer school. Um, that number from 150 has gone up to 200 students are currently enrolled in summer school, either th uh, for classes or through work experience. Um, both of these numbers are higher than what we typically experience during, during summer school programs. Um, the referrals are about double what we would usually get and the students enrolled is about 50 students more than usual. Um, in years past, we've enrolled um, White Bear Lake residents who do not go to White Bear Lake area schools, so kids at AFSA or um, homeschooled kids or, or other kids of that nature. We haven't had any of those students enroll this year in our summer school, so all summer school services are being provided to White Bear Lake area schools students. Um, we have revamped our work experience pr program um, because there are uh, MDE and MDH guidelines about worksite visits and what would be appropriate to visit worksites. So we've changed it from students having a job and working with employers um, to students not necessarily needing a job to earn work experience credit, but building those skills that will get them a job. So as I mentioned before, resume building, mock interviewing, um, job searching and all of those different things. Um, Summer Trades Academy is up is going to be running um, starting in July, which is a fantastic program that teaches uh, students the trades, um, pays them while they're doing it and earns high school credit. Um, we've had 
I think at current time, four students um, accepted to the Summer Trades Academy, um, but that will start up in uh, the beginning of July. And Dan Ross Rossiter is the teacher contact um, liaison with that. I think I think that's um, good for a uh, update on summer school and our distance learning plan. Um, if anyone has any questions, I would love to be able to answer them. I have one thing, uh, Seth, would you mind uh, introducing yourself? There are folks on here who might not know who you are and understand your role. I think we've, we can probably figure it out, but if you just take a moment and explain your role, I, I think that would be a good opportunity for you to introduce yourself to the board and others. Of course, sorry, um, I'm, I'm Seth Salinger. I am a math teacher and instructional coach at um, ALC, and I am a math teacher and computer science teacher at South Campus. Um, I run our um, summer school, and I'm, this is the third year that I've done this. Uh, Dr. K also knows me because I'm finishing my administrative license uh, through the University of Minnesota. So this has been an opportunity for me to um, put my administrative skills to use. Um, and then Brian Pelliquin knows me because I'm a head coach of our tennis program and Nordic ski program. So I wear a lot of hats within the White Bear Lake District, but it's really great to be able to present to all of you and, and show you the hard work that we've done over at the ALC for summer school. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Selinger. Is there any questions uh, regarding the summer school program? I have oh, one, I'm, can you, go oh, ahead. I'm sorry, I was just gonna add, um, I did say that we started today with the 200 kids that we had enrolled. We had over 150 on the first day show up and sign in for their first classes and stay throughout the day, um, which I should have included, but it wasn't on my slide. So it slipped my mind and I apologize. Um, so 75% for distance learning where we had no contact with the kids. Um, Rebecca McCormick and I, who were sort of putting all of this together, consider that a real victory and a real win. Um, we then spent the rest of the day reaching out to those 50 kids and their families to let them know that they needed to sign in tomorrow. Um, so hopefully that number will will drop over the next day or two and we'll, that, that was great. We're really excited about that. So uh, thank you very much. Um, so the Summer Trades Academy, um, yes. is that uh, being ran through us or is that being ran through a different organization? So Summer Trades Academy is run through a different organization um, that students apply um, apply through. Um, it's put together, gosh, uh, I'm sorry, the name of the organization is slipping my mind right now. Um, but school, school districts from across the uh, East Metro, uh, Northeast Metro apply to it and kids get accepted to it. Um, and this year we had four who um, interviewed and, and got accepted to it. All right, brilliant. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions regarding uh, any of the summer school programming? Okay, seeing none, uh, thank you for your report. Uh, we will move on to our next informational item, which is C2, uh, the superintendent's report. Dr. Kazracek. All right, thank you, Chair Mullen, members of the board. <clears throat> All right, so we ended uh, the unusual 2019-2020 school year with celebrations of our class of 2020 and unique pickup events at each of our buildings. If you are interested in watching our virtual graduation ceremonies, you can find links to the YouTube videos that premiered last week on the district's website. The district's mental wellness support line has been extended through the summer. The line will be answered on Wednesdays from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. We will continue to monitor needs and requests and revise the line as needed. And starting this week, all meal pickup locations will move to once a week pickup only on Wednesdays. Each meal bag will contain at least five breakfasts and five lunches. School pickup sites are Onika Elementary, Otter Lake Elementary, and Willow Lane Elementary. Various neighborhood meal pickup sites are available as well. Information is available on the support hub of the district website. And I wanna reiterate that this program is open to all children and that you are not taking meals away from someone who, who you think might need it more. We have enough food for all who, um, who, we have enough food for all who wish to participate. All right, and thank you to our retirees who represent more than 736 years of service to the district. While we weren't able to host a retirement celebration this spring, we did put together a video to honor our retirees that was shared out as a community e-newsletter video edition and is available on the district website. 
We also had a few colleagues who let us know they would be retiring after the video was complete. So I wanted to be sure to acknowledge three additional retirees as well. So thank you all for your service to White Bear Lake Area Schools. And as the end of June approaches, we will say thank you and congratulations to our current Assistant Superintendent for Teaching and Learning, Sarah Paul, who was recently named the new Superintendent for North Branch Area Public Schools. And then after a full search process, we recently offered the position to Dr. Allison Gillespie, who has served as our White Bear Lake Area High School North Campus Principal and was recently a Principal on Special Assignment, overseeing projects related to the District's Strategic Plan, our equity work, and the future of learning component of the facilities process. So welcome to this new role, Dr. Gillespie. And I want to take a moment to express my appreciation and respect to our Bears community, your strength and perseverance during a year that ended differently than any of us imagined is commendable. I have never been so proud to be a Bear. So thank you, Mr. Mullen. Thank you, Dr. Kazmierczak. Are there any questions for Dr. Kazmierczak uh, regarding his uh, report? All right, we will move into our first discussion item, which is the first reading of several board policies. And so I think the best way to do this is to uh, list the policies out. I'll read the policy number uh, starting from the top to the bottom, uh, and then uh, we'll open it up to questions uh, regarding, um, there's several, so I'll go from there. So uh, policy 201, legal status of the school board, Policy 202, school board officers. Policy 203, operation of the school board, governing rules. Policy 203, addendum A. Policy 204, school board minutes. Policy 205, open meeting and closed meeting. Uh, meeting, excuse me. Policy 206, public participation in school board meetings slash complaints about persons at school board meetings and data practice, policy 207, public hearings, policy 208, development, adoption, and implementation of policies, policy 209, code of ethics, policy 211, criminal or civil action against school district, school board, members, employee, or student, uh, policy 212, school board member uh, development, Policy 214, out-of-state travel by school board members, and Policy 215, school board members' code of conduct. Are there any questions regarding any of these policies? I hope everybody's still there. All right. Um, oh. oh, Sorry, took Sorry. me a minute. My Ms. thing Thompson, wouldn't work. Do you have a question regarding the policy? And, Is and it, I, can I are ask we this? asking questions for all of yes. them right now, or are we? Yeah, you can. Yes, you can ask questions for any of them. All I would ask that you do is that as you're working on your question, please indicate the policy that you're asking a question about and the section if there is one uh, applicable. That way, we can all turn to that policy and be able to monitor the question. Okay. Um, I have several. Okay. Um, my first one is on policy 206, section 2A. Let me get there. Sorry, there's, there's a lot of them to go through. I wasn't sure how this would work. Almost there. Okay, sorry about that. Um, in where we struck the word citizens for persons and I just guess I wanted a little uh, clarification as to what the difference is. Dr. Kazmierczak? Yeah, I, I can address that. And then um, if there's any uh, other, anything else to add from either um, Jessica or Kim, please, please fill in. I think it was a, a a term that was used to be broader than just citizens. So it was citizen of the school district. We have, we have members um, 
we have people who um, who may not necessarily be a citizen of the who might not live in the school district, so that it was a broader definition. So that's why it was changed. Okay, thank you. Do you have other questions, Ms. Thompson? I do. Um, on the same policy down in section uh, six, and it is in letter D. I guess I just, I clarifying this, I, I guess maybe my fault that I haven't seen this before, um, but it looks as if we are not allowed to take action during a meeting, the first time an item is raised, that would cause discussion. Is this correct? Dr. Kasmertek, or do you I mean, that would be if, if somebody were to, you know, demand the board take action tonight, you would not take action tonight. That would so be that would be urge. like a public comment period where we had several community members who asked us to take action on an item, but I believe we voted on it that same evening. That was an agenda item that was already on the on the agenda. So if somebody came well, I know the PLA was on. The, did we actually have the public comment period on the agenda? I guess that emerged through the through the discussion item. Okay, but it, so just in the future, that would be something we should take into consideration. That if the public asks us, um, or somebody brings an item to us uh, that evening of a meeting, we should not make action unless, as it states, it's necessary or an emergency which I don't, I mean, I don't know what these things would be, but I just want to make sure that I know for the next time what, that I, that we follow the policy the right way. Well, I would suggest the policy was followed appropriately. I don't know if any other board members have an opinion on that, but um, appreciate your input on that. All right. Um, and then I had in section tool or policy 208, unless anyone had any other things, I guess, for 206 that they wanted to ask, but Ms. Thompson, otherwise my next the, one is in. I was gonna say, I think what the best way to do this, just because we have the technology piece to it, that I think that you should ask your questions and then we'll move on to the next person. And if they have a question regarding the same policy, we can come back. I just, I think it's best uh, just because of technology that we get your questions gone through and then we'll get to the next member. Okay, um, bear with me a minute. Can you tell us the policy so that we can all get there? Uh, policy 208, section one. Um, so we struck the words policy development, adoption, and implementation to be ongoing uh, and substituted those for the word it. Is that what it implies in that statement? This this is Jessica. I can I'm on the policy committee. I can jump in. So I think the thinking here was that it is implied as the policy making role of the school board, and that encompasses the the things that were struck. Okay. Just okay. So anything basically then policy making would be encompassed in there. Yes. Okay. Then my next one would be in 209. And section three. Um, Sorry, hold on one minute. I want to make sure I.
Okay. Uh, sorry. Actually, um, section three in the B portion, the the first one, and this might just be silly, but and I I agree with the statement, but I just want to make sure that we're following. I'm not sure what the rules are, but it says that the primary focus of the school board duties is in the making of policy, but we've changed it to focus on education policy as much as possible. Um, but somebody just explain why we added the word education to make it seem like it's the main focus. I'd ask you, um, I don't know, Kim or Jessica, if you have some insight on the conversation about that and some of these. You know. Yeah, some of these might be MSBA suggestions because we, we take edits from the Minnesota School Board Association. Um, and so in this one in particular, I don't remember if that was an MSBA suggestion. Um, my, my guess is just to be it was done to be as specific as possible and say that, you know, education is what we're here for and, and for the students. Um, but that might be something that we can look into the MSBA suggestions. Kim, do you remember? I don't recall. Um, I think that was the policy committee meeting that I looked at the policies, but at the last minute I couldn't attend uh, due to work uh, issues. But uh, you're likely right, Jessica, that it, uh, was due to an MSBA change. Uh, so many of these changes are MSBA um, recommended changes. Okay, thank you. Um, my next one is in section uh, 215 or policy 215. Uh, let me get there. And it was, I mean, let's see, section four. I'm sorry, I think I might. Okay, sorry, that's the wrong one. Well, you're looking for that, Angela, just a word of correction. I was uh, thinking it was the second reading policies that were coming across tonight that uh, it was that meeting that I missed. Uh, the, the 200s that we're looking at now. Uh, I was at that meeting, and I really, yeah, don't recall uh, that change that you had uh, addressed for uh, 209. Okay. And I might have my I might have wrote, wrote it down wrong, so bear with me. I'm sorry. Two. I think that's it. I think my other stuff is in a different area for later. Sorry. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Are there any Thank other you. questions? Are there any other questions regarding these uh, policies uh, that are up for their first reading this evening? Uh, again, I want to say that they will be back uh, uh, for their next. Ms. Newmaster, Dr. Newmaster, did you have a question? I just have to say, I noticed one word. I wasn't anything other than just amazed and appreciative of the fact that the committee has gone through these policies. And I know how important it is to update it and follow the MSBA suggestions in many cases. But I did notice the change to person versus citizen. And I thought just from the con, what's going on these days, it was nice not to say you must be a citizen to be part of this because we have lots of people. And I thought the word people 
or person was much more inclusive. So that's my only comment on all of that work. And bless you all for getting up early in the morning to do this hard work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Newmaster. Are there any other comments or questions regarding uh, these policies that are before us for the first reading? Okay, uh, seeing none, oh, is there someone, did I miss someone? Seeing none, uh, we will work into our first operational item, E1, uh, which is the action on the property and casual insurance. Uh, Dr. Kasprichek, is this you? Yeah, I will, uh, I'll, I'll kick it off. And um, again, it was brought up earlier, Mr. Wald had to tend to a family matter today, so he's not able to be here. Um, so we will be, uh, I'll be quarterbacking as best I can in his absence. And so right now, um, Mr. Mazorek, are you available? To yes, I am. And then, and then I know we have another guest on to, who will help talk through this, this particular item. So Mr. Mazorek. Good evening, uh, Chairman Mullen, members of the board and Dr. Kazlicek. Um, discussion item or the action item tonight is our property and liability insurance. Um, we have been part of the Minnesota Insurance Scholastic Trust for the last six years. Um, and back a couple months ago, we were alerted that um, because of the hardening of the insurance market that we would be probably seeing a large increase. Um, as you recall, last year we did also receive a large increase um, and that's when the hardening of the market basically started. Um, our consultant on the our, on the uh, for the trust is Gallagher Insurance. They've been working very hard to uh, um, go over our, get um, companies to bid on our our coverages. Um, and I think at this point we have probably the best deal that we can get. Um, the overall pool. Um, for the 23 districts, and actually it's gonna be 24 districts for the 2021 year. Um, we're, we're experiencing a 76% um, in, increase in our premiums. Um, our, pre, our portion will be increasing um, from this year to next year, 59.5. So because of that, you can, you can see that some districts are gonna get more than what we're getting um, but the averaging, but the average was a 76% increase in our premium. Um, there are basically two places where the um, our in, in coverage was, um, or the cost went up, and that was in our excess property. It went from $81,287 up to $187,000, um, and in the loss fund. So the loss fund is what we kind of we, we pre-fund um, part of the losses as a pool, and uh, in order for us to get the coverage for the excess cost or excess property, we had to increase the loss fund. So our in insurance from nineteen our nineteen twenty went from three hundred and twenty six thousand five thirty one to a worst case scenario. A five hundred and twenty thousand nine forty three point four three three. Um, our consultants are still trying to see if they can um, lower that for the whole pool, but at this point in time, we're uh, taking action to at least um, bind the coverage for what we already know. Um, Nick Lano from Gallagher is also online. Um, if uh, you have any other further questions, or Nick, if you'd like to add to what I just um, presented. Nick, are you there? I thought I saw Nick get off, to be honest with you. Oh, no, he's there. Uh, Nick, we're not hearing you if you are, if you are talking. Oh, he might not be able to uh, participate. Um, so with that, unless the, you uh, as a board have um, some questions regarding our coverage. Um, since the inception, we've been in the um, pool since the uh, 14, 15 school year. And at that time we experienced a 31% decrease in our premiums. 
Um, and at the same time, over the last six years, we've um, we've been below what we were in 1314 by about 120,000. What at the same time increasing our property coverage um, with our value is going up. So I think we've it's been good for us. The last two years have been not quite as good for the whole insurance industry. And we're not alone in this. Okay, hey, Tom, this, this is David Howard. I'm also on the line. I'm, I'm Nick's co-broker. Oh, okay. I, 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 don't, I don't know what Nick's technical difficulty is, but I, I'm, I had to call in. I, did, I couldn't get onto the video, but um, I, I, I can speak for, uh, for Nick and, and put this in context a little bit, if you don't mind. Oh, go ahead. Uh, all right. So um, Tom referred to the, the two areas that uh, had the, the significant increases. The first one being the excess property. We are buying uh, as a pool property insurance over a uh, million dollars. And that, that's the piece uh, that, that, is, that is causing the, the huge increase. Um, we had a similar situation with other state entities, public entities this year that, that have kind of the same format where we're, again, we're buying something called excess insurance. Before, um, during the softer market, we were able to take advantage and drive the rate down every year to a point where it was, it was as Tom said, below market. This year with the market started hardening and then we got hit with COVID and then we got hit with the riots and everything like that. The, I've, I've been doing this for 37 years, ladies and gentlemen, and I've never seen anything like this. And so anyways, our percentage went up a lot higher because our, our premium was so low to start with. It's a correction. We're still below the market, but again, it's just because we, we took such advantage of the lower rates, it, it, it's such a significant increase this year. It, it looks, it, 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 uh, again, but it is just a property or a market correction. The loss fund, keep in mind that one of the ways we save money in a pool is by paying the the lower claims. We pay claims up to $100,000 out of our pool. And, and to fund that, we collect a loss fund. And in the past, the, and so that's, that's missed money. That's White Bear Lake money. That's in a missed bank account. It's not premium. It does not go to the insurance company. And that's what we return surplus uh, in the form of cash to our members. We paid our first dividend this year to the original members of 2013 because that loss fund had closed out. Right now on our balance sheet, we have $2.1 million in surplus that would have normally gone to an insurance company and never come back that is earmarked for future dividend returns, all right? There is a time lag because you have to make sure all claims are closed, but the, the pool is working because we have over $2 million available to our group that again would have normally been paid to an insurance company. So this loss fund, the actuaries get involved and they require us to fund up to a certain level of confidence. And in the past, they allowed us to fund only up to a 55% confidence level. So that means 5.5 out of every 10 years, uh, it will be enough to cover what our, what our losses, sh sh what we expect our losses to be. This year, because of everything else that's going on, the insurance company is now requiring us to fund 85% confidence level, all right? So they're saying to us, no, we, we want to make sure that you're gonna fund those losses because anything over that, the insurance company pays. So they got a little tired. We had two years where we exhausted our loss fund and the insurance company got involved. So that's one reason that went up. Another reason it went up is because we decided as a pool as we see premiums increasing, that the way to combat that is to get our, our, our pool to retain more of our own losses, okay, to, to bet on ourselves, if you will. So this year we're proposing from going from $100,000 of every claim that our pool pays to $250,000. It's the sign of a, of, a, of a pool that's starting to mature. And now that we're in year, what are we in here? Year seven, year eight, um, the pool is starting to mature, and it's better for us to pay that money to ourselves rather than to an insurance company. But the result is a significant increase in, in that loss fund because our confidence level is, has gone up that we have to fund, and we're deciding to take on more risk. The only good news for that is that, again, that's missed money. That's not insurance com company money. 
And if we, if the actuaries are right, that's money that will come back in future years to White Bear Lake in the form of a dividend or a surplus. So that's kind of the context of, 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 of what happened. I, I'm willing to, uh, or uh, available to take on any other uh, questions. Uh, Tom was right. White Bear Lake is, is probably performing the best in the group, and that's why you received an additional 15% credit that others did not. There's a um, we, we reward uh, members that have better than average performance, and we penalize the ones that have the worst performance. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention about that uh, pr uh, property insurance. Another thing that insurance companies are doing that they didn't do before is when they, they do their catastrophic modeling, the worst thing that can happen, it used to be they didn't include all the hail information for Minnesota. Minnesota's hail claims have gotten worse and worse and worse over the last decade. And now the insurance companies include this convective modeling in their insurance, especially in the reinsurance. It has driven the rates rates up significantly. So all of these things have combined uh, to just create, I mean, it's affecting, it's affecting the insurance companies the same way it's affecting school districts and businesses across the world. It's just something we've never seen before. But I think the takeaway is, is the, the pool is working. It's the best method for what we call a hard market because we can retain the, uh, the quality coverage and, uh, and, and, and we can keep that into the future. Where other insurance companies now are striking that stuff out, they're putting all kinds of exclusions for traumatic brain injury, for COVID virus, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have any of that. We're not changing our terms. All right. Thank you. Very. Is there anything else, Mr. Wazorek? Not for me, no. Okay. I think uh, at this point, it's probably best for us to uh, uh, get a motion on it on the table, on the floor, and uh, – the administration is recommending that we approve the property and casual insurance package uh, with the Minnesota Insurance Scholastic Trust missed uh, in the amount of $520,943.33, effective July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. Uh, is there a motion to do so? So moved. A motion by Mr. Chapman. Is there a second? Second. Second by Dr. Arcan. Are there any questions regarding the recommended action? Chair Mullen, uh, by not so much a question, I've got uh, just a comment uh, to make. As um, is, is I think the board knows, um, my job is dealing with insurance on a day to day basis for one of our major healthcare systems. And I can tell you that. Um, this, what we're seeing on the property side uh, is exactly what is happening in the industry. Uh, as much as we don't like it, <laughs> any of us, to see the the high price tags um, that are coming about, it is indicative of what is happening in the insurance industry. Quite frankly, I am uh, rather uh, pleasantly surprised to see that on some of the other lines of coverage, uh, that there haven't been greater increases than what this graphic shows because uh, the the entire uh, commercial insurance industry and and to some extent I would guess it's going to trickle into the property or excuse me the uh, personal uh, insurance industry but the commercial industry is uh, going through just uh, basically a convulsion I mean it's uh, the hardening of the market and by hardening we mean where prices are, our premiums are going way up, coverages are being restricted. In some cases, policies are being non-renewed by insurers or canceled. Um, this is, uh, this is, you know, I like I say, I'm pleasantly surprised by what I'm seeing on these other lines. And the property, we're just, I can tell you, we're holding our breath where I work because uh, our property renewal comes up 10-1 and we have received all kinds of indications, it's it's not gonna be likely very pretty. So just my two cents uh, on this whole thing. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. Um, are there any other comments, concerns, questions that uh, the, the board members would like to say? All right, uh, seeing none, uh, this will require a roll call vote uh, would the clerk please rec uh, read the roll? 
Thompson? Aye. Arcan? Aye. Chapman? Aye. Ellison? Aye. Mullen? Aye. New Master? Dr. Newmaster. Oh, I thought I turned it on. Hi. Thank you very much. Uh, and the motion passes. Uh, we will now move into our next operational item, uh, E2, which is the action on refinancing of the 2013-2014 leases. Uh, Dr. Kazmierczak, is this you? Yep, I'll take it. Thank you, Chair Mullen, members of the board. And some of you were around back when um, these projects uh, took place. And so um, it's a sign that we have some longevity on the board for some of you, perhaps. But back in 2013 and 2014, we used lease levy uh, as the financing tool to build gymnasium additions at Lake Ayers, Matoska, and Willow Lane Elementary Schools. The final years of payment on the gyms are fiscal year 28 for Matoska and fiscal year 29 for Lake Ayers and Willow Lane. So the current interest rates, terms of uh, the agreement, and current and future bonding plans make refinancing, refinancing now a financially prudent move. So I believe we have Shelby McQuay on. I hope we can hear you. Hopefully. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Success. Great. And I will. Uh, I think I'll just turn it over to you, Shelby. Um, do you need the what, – what do you need us to display? Or are you just going to talk through it? So I see what's in your board packet is your uh, resolution. Do you also have the pre-sale report? Otherwise, I'll just speak just briefly to the resolution. We have the pre-sale report that we could bring up if that if that would be helpful. Otherwise, sure. yeah. Then we can look at the the numbers. Of, okay. Um, uh, yeah, and the savings there. So either Marissa or Steve will bring up that that document. All right. So. Um, You'll have As to know where to go or how to, how to navigate it. So tell us what page um, you'd like us on. Yeah, you can just go ahead and um, move to the, the second page there. So as Dr. Kazmierczak mentioned, these were the three leases that were the additions to the elementary schools. So um, Matoska, Willow Lane, and Lake Gares Elementary. Um, and what we're doing today, so we've been, you know, watching these. They've, they're relatively low interest rates to begin with. Um, but by packaging them all together and then issuing um, one certificate of participation, you're going to sort of reap the benefits of the lower interest rates that you get from from one renewing now or refunding it now because of the lower interest rates, but also um, in terms of packaging as a certificate of participation or a COP so that you can put it out for public bid, which tends to generate lower interest rates than uh, lease, uh, lease purchase. So the um, current interest rate that you locked in at with the 2013A was 3.75. And I'm looking right in the middle of the purposes section here. Um, the 2013B um, was locked in at 4% um, as an annual interest rate. And then the 2014 was a 3.89. And our current estimates for the um, refinancing of these would be a 1.6. So um, savings through um, fiscal years 28 and then 29 for the other two. What that means in terms of your total savings um, to um, to the the lease levy is about 650,000 on a net present value basis. So almost eight percent of your total debt service that you're saving um, each year. That's about you know a little over ninety thousand. Um, so that's really good savings. So um, by moving from a lease purchase to a certificate of participation, um, you'll still be accessing the lease levy through this. And the savings are not going to, again, um, as you've gone through this before with other refundings, the savings are not to the district, but they are to the taxpayers. So on your levy, that's where um, the savings would, would come into play. Um, so the authority still is the 126 c um, 40 uh, that's the lease levy authority that um, that you're using to to um, to refund these. Uh, the total term of the new issue will be about eight and a half years, so um, kind of less than that range that you want to really look to refinance again. So, so what we end up here with um, will be locked in for the remainder of the term. Um, these will be deemed bank qualified, so um, you're well over for this um, year your full 
your $10 million capacity for a bank qualified the, with the $250 million issue of the two, uh, 2020A. So because these were bank qualified to begin with, you can then deem them bank qualified. So it sort of gets you into this um, additional resource. Um, bank qualified um, issuance just means that you have access to um, kind of a, a broader market because there's benefits to banks um, in terms of their tax uh, um, tax benefits to to bid on these. So um, that's where we're again seeing that 1.6 low interest rate. So I'm just moved on to the next page. Um, you'll go through sort of the same process again um, uh, as you did with the other the 2020A issue, and you'll um, get a rating for this. So it'll be a, your full process that you go through for a rating. Um, uh, and your current underlying rating is um, a double A. Um, because these are um, not general obligation, they're an annual appropriation that you make each year on your lease levy, the rating is notched one below your rating. So your double A rating, and then one notch below is the double A. Um, minus, which is still a great rating. So um, again, recommending these because of the lower interest rates of the certificate of participation, there's a little bit higher um, cost of issuance associated with it because you have to um, do a full um, official statement to put it out to market, but the, um, the costs are made up um, in terms of the lower interest rate. Um, generally, uh, and I think I'll, I'm moving on to the next page under un other considerations, so um, sometimes when we go to market, you'll um, go to market on the same day and then the board will award that night several of your bond issues. You've done a parameters bond issue. So the resolution you're adopting tonight sets a, a limit on how much you um, must save in order to award this. So um, so other under other considerations you're actually designating as part of the um, resolution tonight, you're designating the superintendent or, su or assistant superintendent for finance and operations and a board officer to accept the most favorable proposal. And then that'll be July 9th. So not a board meeting date. And then you'll ratify on the 13th. Um, that extra flexibility, um, one gets you off of a Monday, which tends to have a lot of bond issues. So maybe a, an additional favorable rate with that, but also to um, move this to close on the payment date, which is July 30th. So all that, um, then your board, the board will ratify or um, sort of affirm the sale at the July 13th meeting. Um, the in the incorporated into the resolution are the parameters. So um, as part of the savings, even though we're um, uh, estimating that it'll save about 8%, we're ensuring that you you won't award if the savings is less than 2.5%. So it's sort of a kind of a backstop for the board to say, no, we don't want to go through with this if the savings are minimal. So that's what's incorporated into the resolution. Um, just a review of your over, um, your existing debt. We're um, continually keeping an eye on that. And, um, and your uh, 2012 B school building bonds are callable coming up on February 1, 2020. Um, we are estimating the savings right now to be um, about 175,000. So we'll continue to keep an eye on that and um, move forward with that or uh, um, recommend to move forward with that if the savings continue to be there at the time that the bonds are callable. Um, moving on, continuing disclosure and arbitrage monitoring are um, uh, pieces of the tax exempt debt issuance process that you continually partake in and you have been, and there's no change with this bond issue there. Um, the risk factors listed um, and will be incorporated into the official statement are just the fact that this is an annual appropriation that the board is making and not a general obligation bond. So different than, um, than how you accessed a bond issue for your voter approved bond. Your um, other service providers are listed there. The schedule is on the next page that I sort of outlined. We'll work with um, uh, Mr. Wald and um, Dr. Kazmarchek on the due diligence call and distributing the official statement, pulling that all together, the conference with the uh, rating agency, and then we'll be back to you with the results on July 13th. Um, then on July 30th, is the date that the old lease will be paid off and the new uh, COP will be begin. Um, so just the last remaining pages to show the um, the sources and uses, why the par amount is set at 
at what it is, the cost of issuance. Prior original debt service is listed on the pages 8, 9, and 10 for the um, 20, the two 2013 issues and then the 2014 issues. So you can see um, the intra or the average interest rate at 3.75, 4, and then 3.89. And then I moved all the way down to um, page 11, which shows uh, the the new payment schedule um, for for this issue. Uh, the 1.6 percent true interest cost is listed on that page, and then the next page is just the savings comparison. Um, I would note very briefly that um, uh, SMP has made it known um, to us that they would like to see a 4-1 payment date instead of a 2-1 payment date. So we intend to distribute a revised pre-sale report to administration that they can pass along to you with just a change in the payment date. The um, SMP uh, has tended to notch it down, notch your rating down to ratings if you do not um, have enough time in between budget adoption and when your first payment is due. Of course, in Minnesota, that's not really a problem because we know you have to adopt your budget by 630, but they're looking at it from a national point of view. And so we're just going to align um, this debt service schedule with um, their preferences to ensure that the rating stays as high as possible. And we'll work with the administration on that. So um, overall, I think it's a good time to move forward. It's great savings to the district taxpayers for um, and to lock in at lower interest rates given the current market right now. So I'm happy to answer any questions on that or the last question. Thank you very much for the report. Um, I think at this point, uh, it's probably best if we get a motion on the table and uh, and sure. recommend it. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Can I uh, can I read the recommended action? I made a change, and we're gonna. Um, so you were just gonna do that, correct? You, yep. I'm, so please do so because I've got the. All right. Go ahead. I'm gonna do that. So the recommended action is that we approve the resolution stating the intention of the school board to issue a lease purchase financing and refunding certificates of participation series uh, 2020B. So that would be the motion. Okay, you've heard the recommended action. Is there a motion to do so? Motion to approve. Uh, motion by Dr. Newmaster. Is there a second? Second. A second by Ms. Thompson. Any discussion regarding the recommended action? Uh, not seeing any. Uh, I would ask this will require a roll call vote. And I would ask the clerk to please read the roll. Thompson. Aye. Arkan. Aye. Chapman. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Mullen. Aye. Newmaster. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you all very much. Uh, we will now move into our third operational item, E3 which is the action on the transportation contract. Uh, Dr. Kazmichek is issue. Thank you, Chair Mullen and members of the board. Um, so Mr. Torito, are you still there? I am here. All right, so do you, do you wanna just take it over or? Um, sure, either or. Yeah, go, why don't you just go right ahead and jump in as you were part of the, the team that uh, worked with our vendors to come up with these contracts. All righty, thank you. Chair Mullen, school board, Dr. Kazmierczak. Um, this is a process that we started back in February, um, serving legal notices and having meetings with our contractors. Um, as you know, um, we have about uh, 43 of our own buses plus some uh, type three vans. And with that, we need some additional help. So that's where we look to outside contractors to help us with those resources. Um, we had about 21 firms that uh, uh, submitted a quote to us. Um, two of the uh, full service providers, First Student and MTN. MTN is uh, um, not a new company, but they're new to us. They've been working over in Moundsview. They've been awarded the uh, Stillwater contract. Um, we are looking to have them as a backup service provider. Um, just in case, given the times that we're in and the unknowns, we feel as though we needed that as well as they will be helping out on the type three side. 
Um, the type three contracted transportation services, these are uh, the providers that will meet our uh, district special ed and special ed routes and, and uh, just those low density type things outside the district. We uh, currently contract with three of them. We are looking at uh, renewing them for a two plus two. Um, all these are two plus two contracts. And uh, with that, um, that's about all I have. Um, any questions? Thank you, Mr. Torito. I think the best thing for us to do would be to Unless Dr. Kazmierczak had anything additional, uh, I would recommend that uh, we have a recommended action, uh, and I would ask us to get a motion on the table, and then we'll open it up for discussion. So we have a recommended action to approve the agreement with the uh, Twin Cities Transportation Inc., Treasured uh, uh, Transportation Inc., Halo Inc., uh, to provide Type Three uh, student transportation services for two years, commencing August first, twenty twenty and ending July 31st, 2022, with an option to extend for two years uh, consistent with the Minnesota Statute 2015, uh, Section 123B-52, and I don't need to read the subsection. So is there a motion to do so? So moved. Motion by Ms. Thompson. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Chapman. Uh, any discussion regarding the recommended action? Chair Mullen, I have a question, two questions. Uh, okay, go ahead, Ms. Elson. Um, so in looking at the recommended action, we're taking action tonight on the type three student transportation services, correct? And not the first student in MTN, is that right? Yes, that is my understanding. Yes, and I and Mr. My, Torito, if you can, you want to add to that? I, I but I believe. Yeah, yeah, I in looking at this, I think the direction was to approve all uh, five of the contracts. I believe those were presented in the package. Okay, on my on my recommended action that I have, I only have the three. So. If we need to amend it, I need to, we probably need to do that now. Yeah, let me let me make sure that everything is in here. So we have first student. Yeah, first transportation agreement listed in the board packet is first student. Yep. Okay, and then the under the minutes that I received this evening, it was for Twin Cities Transportation, uh, Treasured uh, Transportation, and Halo. So yep. guys, if there's some additional, then I want to make sure we get those. Jessica, is that what's on, Ms. Ellison, is that what's on your minutes also? Yes, that's what's on the minutes, and that's why I wanted to double check. Um, so, I, I also had a question about the um, the backup transportation once we've addressed this issue. So I would, um, whatever steps we need to take to amend the motion, is the uh, first student is, is in the packet, as is the... Um, the MTN. So there was a, uh, those are inadvertently left off of the recommended action. So Miss um, Ellison, if you can hold on one second, I think what we'll do is Miss Thompson, um, if you and Mr. Chapman uh, would be willing to amend your motion to include first student uh, and any of the other transportation that was in the board packet, uh, is that amenable? Is that agreeable to you? Yeah. Okay, so I'd ask the record to reflect that Ms. Thompson, Mr. Chapman? Yes, I'm fine with it. Okay, so I would ask the record to reflect that uh, all the uh, transportations that are in the packet, Ms. Ellison, if you can ask, if you can let the minutes reflect that, I would appreciate it. Yes, they're included now. Okay, so then from there, I believe that you have a question and please uh, go ahead and state your question. Sure. I just have a question about the um, MTN as a backup provider. My question is, is this something that we've done in the past or is this in response to potential needs for more busing depending on what happens with 
uh, distance learning or a hybrid um, coming up this fall? What was the, the need for the backup? Yeah, currently we use um, Raybine uh, transportation for three of our routes um, and they were significantly higher in price. And in talking with first student, they looked to take on those three additional routes that we had last year. So, but with that being said, we still want to be able to make sure we have a backup plan for activities in case uh, there just seems to be a shortage. As you know, there's a shortage of bus drivers and with the COVID and, and so forth, I've had recently four drivers of my own retire. So um, we just feel as though there's a need for that uh, additional ba backup. There's no guarantee they'll get the work. However, they're there in case we need them. So well, Jessica, I think the, I, I mean, I, my two cents, the, the answer is yes. We've done this in the past. We can we'll continue doing it in the future, and in the in the future, it uh, might very well be because of the impacts of, of what we're experiencing right now here this spring and then into the fall. So it'll be probably more important than ever that we have we have a backup provider. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, is there any other questions or comments regarding uh, the recommended action? Uh, seeing none, um, we have a motion and a second, and we have an amended recommendation. Uh, this will require a roll call vote, and I would ask the clerk to please uh, call the roll. Thompson? Aye. Arcan? Aye. Chapman? Aye. Ellison? Aye. Mullen? Aye. Newmaster? Aye. Okay, the motion passes. Thank you very much. We'll now move into our next operational item, E4, which is the action on the approval of the NJPA purchase order for the ALC phase one renovation. Uh, Dr. Kazmichek. Thank you, Chair Mullen, members of the board. So the first project funded by the November referendum is scheduled to begin this summer and to be completed before school starts in the fall. It's the phase one project at the ALC. So this renovation will provide updated security features, including an improved secure entrance, as well as a renovated office space. One unique element of this project is that we are using the National Joint Powers Alliance, or NJPA, now managed by Sourcewell. This process allows us to benefit from the joint purchasing power of the program and will allow us to move more quickly to get the work started than if we were using a traditional RFP process, and, um, as we will on our other projects. So instead of approving bids, the board is asked to approve a purchase agreement. So Bob Jansen from uh, the district's construction management firm of Kraus Anderson is on, I believe. Um, and he is here to explain the NJPA process and to answer any questions that you have. So Bob, are you, are you there? Yep, uh, I'm here. Uh, uh, thank you for your guys' time tonight, uh, members of the board. Uh, so real quick, I'll kind of explain the the National Joint Powers Agreement. We is Carl Sanderson has contracts throughout the state of Minnesota. Uh, these contracts um, allow us to to uh, utilize to utilize the e Gordian process, which is a set. Uh, it is a catalog per se. I've got uh, Chris here with Gordian who can explain a little bit more in depth the actual Gordian process and what that means and how it uh, pertains and how you guys, how White Bear may have used it in the past. Uh, Chris, are you available as well? I am. Chris, um, you want to you wanna quick talk a little bit more about what the NJPA does? Yeah. The NJPA was set up by the state of Minnesota as a service cooperative um, and given the legislative authority to negotiate contracts on behalf of their members. It's now uh, done a marketing change and it's, it's uh, source. Well, they're out of Staples, Minnesota. Um, I had them check. You guys are members and have purchased um, several items on a contract purchasing basis. And this easy IQC program that you're proposing to use is the construction arm of source. Well, Gordian, who I work for, 
is the uh, administrator for on behalf of Sourcewell of the program. And the reason we get involved, as Bob said, was Gordian is the worldwide leader in construction cost data. So the whole program revolves around our construction cost data, um, which is a construction task catalog of over 280,000 construction items. And our team comes in and does market research in the, in the Twin Cities. The, the state of Minnesota is actually divided up into seven different regions. So um, there's different pricing in seven regions around the, around the state. And what Sourcewell then does is advertises for bid jumps through all of the legal requirements that you guys would normally have to if you issued an RFP for any construction. And then general contractors and roofers and pavers are invited to respond to that bid, um, just as if there was a major construction project. Then they're asked to submit a competitive, a sealed competitive bid known as their adjustment factor to which they will apply that adjustment factor to all of the pricing in our catalog. And then Sourcewell uh, reviews those bids on a best value basis with the adjustment factor being the largest, uh, heavy, most heavily weighted component. And then they award contracts to, to various contractors. And then as was discussed, you guys are allowed to then access construction services directly through one of those awarded contractors. Thanks, Chris. Um, some, of the, some of the benefits and why we kind of chose to use the NJPA upon discussion is uh, that the way we can expedite projects, this one in particular, these small project, these projects of this size where we're remodeling essentially the front entrance providing more security, some, some uh, mechanical improvements. Uh, so overall, we're looking at a duration of about six to eight weeks on this. On this, uh, We can expedite this process, essentially. The plans on this were received in uh, April and we were able to get this out to competitively bid this as well, make sure, and we got, we, got, we did end up with uh, very good coverage on this project in particular. Um, take advantage of that, get shop drawings moving a lot faster than what we would have with the more traditional model. Uh, and this way we can ensure that we will can finish the project here uh, over summer. Um, is there any other questions pertaining to the process? Uh, I'm sure there are some. Go ahead, Dr. Newmaster. I'm just wondering now after we had our extensive conversation the last time around about prevailing wage, how does that fit in with this bidding process? Do they meet our requirement that we discussed exhaustively before? They do. Uh, with this project, all uh, it, we do have the same requirements on it. Uh, we, prevailing wages will, will and have been applied to the numbers that, that we put together for this project. Okay. Are there any other questions? So there's a recommended action uh, would be to approve the NJ. Sorry. Oh, I had a, a question, well. sorry. Always trouble Go getting that something. mute off. Um, I was just wondering, in here it looks like we just have little bits and pieces of the full uh, language that it would be involved in this document I'm sorry could I'm sorry could you could you expand on that please um like C says that section 18.2 shall be deleted in its entirety or B is section 7 point but it it would appear there's a lot of other sections to this but we don't we only have part of it Yep. So, so right now the, so the, uh, the point that we're at now, this is a, the letter that you are viewing is the, is the first component of it. There's an amendment that comes out that gives you a full breakout of the quantities that are being put into the Gordian system. So we are working through that process right now. So essentially with the PO that you're seeing, uh, this document is giving you essentially the, the not to exceed the, uh, the, the pricing that we've put together. 
as a lump sum in here. We on in this scenario and with the way that the national joint powers in these purchase orders would work, Carl Sanderson carries all the contracts uh, versus when we do the CMA uh, process and the school district would hold these subcontracts. So this is one purchase agreement for the for for that uh, number. But the amendment then should be coming here in the next week that would also break out and show uh, in some more detail to what the system kicks out and how it comes to that number. Okay, so in the in part D there, I guess I'm not sure how this uh, num number 12, part D, uh, I guess, could you just explain, is this just saying if, you know, damage, I mean, I, I think I understand what this is saying. Say one of the subcontractors or somebody else was to cause damage during the job. I guess could you just explain how what what is being said there? Um, on part D. Um, yeah. Let me just real quick just get to where you were at. So you said it was under twelve. Part yep. D. Yep. That says inserted as section twenty five point seven. And then there's yep. that. Um, that's going to be uh, contract language. It's going to help sort out uh, as far as the insurance that, that would apply versus builders and uh, and if there is damage uh, to help sort out claims. Okay. It uh, just says the owner and the contractor waive all rights against each other and any of the subcontractors, sub subcontractors, agents, and employees, and each other. Um, I guess maybe I'm reading it wrong, but is, who, who is it saying is responsible for the damage? It would be, typically it's going to fall, it's going to, with this, the way that it's written, it would be under the responsibility of uh, who, whoever would be at fault for that damage. Okay. It would, it would it would it would it would fall to that. So so it helps to protect, essentially, the owner, uh, the contractors that were not involved in the damage, to make sure that 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 upon investigation that the the contractor that would be at fault would be responsible for it, and their insurance would be responsible for that. Okay. And so then that's part E there, where it just says. A contractor and owner waive claims against each other for any consequential damages arising or relating to the agreement? Correct. Okay. okay. All right, that's it. Okay, any other questions? Don, you're muted. I apologize. Thank you. So I want to get a motion on the table before we proceed any further, and then we'll open it up into discussion, please. So we have a recommended action to approve the NJPA purchase agreement for the security and office renovation at the Area Learning Center. Is there a motion to do so? So moved. Who, who made the motion? Ms. Elson? Yes. Is there a second? Second. Second by Dr. Arcan. All right. Uh, are there any other questions regarding the recommended motion? I have a. I have one question. Um, so currently, uh, the district uses the uh, the best responsible bidder policy so this would not take a play uh, or this would not take effect uh, because you guys will then select all the contractors correct we we will select all the co all the contractors and we did put this put this out uh, for bid and we did get coverage and uh, uh, with our policy as well we will make sure that we are selecting the uh, lowest responsible bidder for this as well okay and so how I, I respectfully understand that uh, puts us in a bigger pool uh, with other contractors. I'm just kind of curious on, can you just kind of give me a, a quick scenario of how this 
benefits us. We lose, we basically lose site control to you guys. And I'm trying to understand how this benefits the district. Uh, the big, the biggest benefit is going to be schedule. Uh, it allows, it allows this to be, to expedite the, the bid process so that while we are still worse and while we were in the, the design phase, we were able to get this out and get this and get this for bid, get shop drawings moving to start procuring uh, the material that's needed to complete the project uh, before uh, school for uh, the next uh, school season, school year starts. So that couldn't have been done um, with this typical system that is used in school construction. Um, in, in this in this case, we with with uh, how the how the plans were coming along and with uh, the design on this, we we didn't feel that we would be able to get the project started uh, in a timely fashion to be able to uh, to complete the project before this with the school year were to start. So, Dr. Kasmerchek, or am I wrong to say that we've been planning these uh, additions and renovations for almost a, a year now? Or at least six months, correct? The schematic. I don't know exactly when the schematic design process started for the ALC, but um, within the last few months, yeah, four, four months or so, four or five months. Okay. Okay, I mean, listen, I'm all for ex expediting the, the system and making things better and making things quicker. I'm just trying to understand how this system is, you know, we've already been kind of planning for the last six months. Now they're telling us we don't have enough time. So I'm, I'm just kind of curious, did they bring this to us or did we seek this out? Um, well, I wasn't in the initial conversations with... Um with Krauss Anderson and, and you know, um, Tim, Tim certainly was involved. And I know this is something that was discussed early on as an option. Um, we've used the National Joint Powers Alliance before. They, we, we meet all the bid requirements um, that the state uh, has for school districts through the, through the joint power. Um, so this is not, a, is not an uncommon model. Um, so it certainly is a viable option for the, for the smaller projects. Okay, and I, and I respect that. I, I'm sorry, I'm someone I'm getting some feedback from templates. Um, I respect that. I'm just trying to figure out. I mean, they're telling us that this model isn't, if you haven't gone in and kind of made sure what is what it is, then how do we trust, uh, you know, that it's what it's supposed to do is going to get done? Well, um, Again, I, I know we've used the NJPA in the past. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, it's vetted. They, it's allowed by statute and the common procurement for school districts. Hey, Chris. Is, is Chris, are you still available as well? Yes, I am. Would, uh, do you want to talk to that a little bit in, uh, as far as cost history? And I mean, we've Yep. just to the extent that we have been using it? Yeah. Um, what this is, this is really a procurement tool. This allows you to work directly with an awarded general contractor. There's nothing will change in the construction process. It is a direct uh, construction contract between you, the district, and Kraus Anderson. So there are a number of benefits to using the system. Of course, I'm a little biased, but but, you know, the, uh, the biggest one is you get to develop a relationship with the general contractor as opposed to being forced to use whoever happens to come in as the low bid on any particular project. Uh, a byproduct of that is that you develop that relationship and now the contractor is rewarded or, or has the opportunity to be rewarded for future work based on their performance as opposed to the traditional method where they're going to try to do a good job for you and then also hope that when they roll the dice on the next bid, they're also the low bidder. So there's an inherent ability uh, or there's an inherent accountability factor to this. It also allows, as we've seen, you know, the, the timing factor really in this case 
was not so much the the bids and how long that would take. It would allow, it allowed for a little bit of a collaborative effort between the design team and the contractor. So the contractor is getting access to some of the plans ahead of time and, and can offer. A lot of times we've seen some very significant um, savings or value engineering done by having the contractor involved throughout the design process, not just waiting till the design is completely finished and then just given a couple of weeks to take a look at it and, and uh, develop bids. So, uh, but as far as the project itself, it's a regular construction contract between yourselves and Krauss Anderson as the general contractor um, and everything that's inherent to that normal construction process. Gordian will stay involved if there's any change orders. And the key here is you get to work with directly with the, the general contractor but there's an inherent backup or accountability using our construction cost data. So any, this initial price proposal will have to be justified using the construction task catalog. And that's where Bob referenced that that will be coming. And then any change throughout the process has to be backed up using our numbers. So you don't have the, the opportunity, the contractor doesn't have the opportunity to really potentially leave some items out to be that low bidder and then once they get halfway through the project, have the district over a barrel and try to make up some lost ground on a change order because everything reverts back to the exact same pricing structure that we had to use at the beginning to develop the original price proposal. So then a follow-up to that would be is, uh, so currently um, we are, uh, Krauss at K is, is a construction manager and they're providing a service and there's a fee associated with that service. Is there a fee also associated with this service? There is an administrative fee that the contractor pays to uh, Sourcewell and to Gordian as part Sourcewell. of the, the, That was factored in there. That had to be factored into their original adjustment factor when they bid on the program. So the school district does not pay that fee? No. No. You have one, you have one PO... Uh, with Krauss Anderson, our paperwork is there just to justify the procurement process to show that you didn't bypass the competitive bid process. It just took place earlier on with Sourcewell. All right. I appreciate you answering my questions. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? I have a few. Okay. Ms. Thompson. Um, as, you know, we had a pretty in-depth conversation the last open meeting. I'm sure everybody is aware of that. Um, one of the things that we talked in great discussion was about transparency and we um, denied the community their opportunity to allow their voices to be heard on this matter. And now I feel like we're, we're denying the voices even further by not allowing um, board members to see who the bidders are and who the projects are being awarded to before they're being awarded, which to me would also mean that um, one of the arguments was that we were doing what we were doing to ensure um, that everybody had the right to work on these uh, wonderful projects in our district and even including the mom and pop um, shops. Um, in our many different policies we are trying to implement tonight, there's great discussion of code of ethics and the role of the school board and our commitment to the community and to transparency and everything that we do. And, uh, you know, tonight, as I read in policy 209, section D, uh, number four, it says that I will, D says, in meeting my responsibilities to my community, I will strive to uphold my responsibilities and accountability to the taxpayers in my school district. Um, I don't feel that we're doing this by shutting out um, our ability to see who bid on the projects and to discuss who the bidders are. As I mentioned in that meeting uh, prior to this, the low bidder does not always equal the uh, most qualified company to do the job. Um, I don't see this as being beneficial. Um, I see this as more, um, to me, it's not transparent at all. To me, this is 
goes against everything that we discussed in the last meeting, even against those who who had their voices heard for the decision that was made. And that decision was made so that we were speaking for all of our community members. This does not show that we are doing that. This shows that we are giving the control to one larger group. And I have nothing against Carl Sanderson. This is not personal. Uh, to me, there's been a lot going on in our country uh, in the last couple of weeks. And I feel this is another way of um, allowing one big conglomeration to be in charge of everything that happens on the smaller level. Uh, this does not um, provide transparency to me. I don't really have any questions. Um, I just wanted to make that statement. Um, and I guess uh, that's really all I have because I, do I don't have any specific questions to ask. Thank you, Ms. Thompson, for the statement. Are there any other comments or concerns or statements that anybody else would like to make? Hearing or, hearing or seeing none, uh, Ms. Ellison, are you all going to get ready to call the roll or would you like to make a comment? Oh, I was just wondering, um, Dr. Kazmierczak, you've said that we have, we've used this process before. <clears throat> we use the, uh, uh, and JPA for the gymnasium floor at South Campus, as an example. And it worked the same way? Right. It, it, uh, it allows us to procure um, through and, and meet all of our obligations as laid out by state statute. Mm -hmm. And so do you feel that in the ways that we've done this in the past, that the work has been done to satisfaction yeah from the the projects that I'm aware of it, it has been yeah and mm -hmm. a lot of other school districts in Minnesota use the NG NJPA that's correct is that right yep it's okay a procurement model right so it's it's not something that is out of the ordinary or unusual for a school district to do. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I just I just wanted to, to clarify that um, you know it, it's hard for me to understand a, a lot of the the way that the finance works and the way that the um, um, this process works, but I, I feel like if the district has done this before in a way that's been satisfactory and we are not alone in, in districts using this type of process, then um, it seems to me that uh, it, there's, it, it seems to me that this has worked for us and can continue to work for us. So that's, I just wanted to clarify. Thank you for your statement, Ms. Ellison. Are there any other comments, questions or statements? I would just add one quick statement to that. Ms. Thompson? Uh, if we are speaking about state statute and what has been done in the past, I think we could all reflect on these last couple of weeks uh, of what state statute has allowed to happen before. And um, sometimes what has happened and is used by multiple organizations doesn't equal that it is the just thing or the right thing to do. It just means it is what has always been done. And possibly there might be another way of making it happen. I'm not sure what the other instances were for why we used this process. If the, maybe the projects were needed to be done faster, I, I don't uh, really know, but it seems we've had plenty of time to allow for the bidding process. And I just, um, I guess I'm just kind of wondering why we've decided we i mean we we heard bids we've been hearing bids at almost every meeting up until now i just find it to be a curious timing if i could just uh, interject one quick second please I ask board members to please wait to be recognized by the chair um, as we move through this process thank you for your statement uh, ms thompson dr newmaster did you have a comment i just 
thought I heard in the beginning of this that this process is one that is state approved, which would mean they ought to be meeting all the requirements. They haven't been eliminated yet for equity, multiple people putting bids in if, and they just have to meet the requirements that that's placed in it. So, I mean, I feel like it's maybe an expeditious way to do it for us. Um, as long as it meets all the check boxes for equity and letting a variety of people put in a bid, I, it seems to me like it's a way to maybe save a little money if we're not paying extra and we can still provide quality and, and speed and fairness. So I hope I'm understanding that correctly. They do need to, to check off all the boxes for Dr. equity yeah. and fairness. Dr. Kazmierczak, do you want to answer that question? Yeah, as I stated before, it's a it's a procurement method that's utilized and this, it's state approved and we meet our obligation as a school district to um, go through the bidding process through this manner. It's a common way of, uh, you know, joint powers agreements are a common way of, um, of working. So this is not something new. It's not something unusual. Um, so yes, it's been around. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Kazmierczak. Are there any other questions, comments, or concerns? Chair Mullen. Yes. Oh, I just Ms. wanted Ellison. to. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank Dr. Newmaster for bringing that up. Um, I, I think that that's a, a good point that I hadn't considered, the fact that the state um, has to approve it. And as a, as a historian, I, I fully understand um, that sometimes the way that things done are done is not always the right way, but I appreciated Dr. Newmaster's um, emphasis on, on that. So, um, so thank you. All right, are there any other comments, questions, or concerns? Hearing or seeing none, I would ask the, this will require a roll call vote, would ask the clerk to please read the roll. Thompson? Nice. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Could you say that? If, if we're saying no, how? what's the appropriate word? Were you? Nay, that would be the appropriate Nay. verb. Sorry, thank you. Nay. Arcan? Aye. Chapman? Aye. Ellison, aye. Mullen? Aye. Newmaster? Aye. Okay, uh, with the majority of the members voting aye, uh, the motion passes. Uh, we will now move into our next operational item, um, E5, which is the action of the fiscal year 2021 preliminary budget. Uh, Dr. Kazmierczak, I know Mr. Walt's not here, so I'll go keep going to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Mullen, members of the board. And um, Mr. Wazorek is going to lead us through this item, and I will certainly um, add to that as needed. So, Tom, do you want to take over? And <clears throat> yes, I will. Uh, Tom, before you begin, what, what you're seeing tonight is essentially unchanged from the work study meeting um, from a few weeks back. So, um, so just to give you some context, that, that it's consistent with what has what you've seen before. That is correct. Um, just to uh, remind you that the um, the board needs to uh, pass a preliminary budget prior to June thirtieth for the uh, 2021 school year. Um, we did review this back in May um, and there has not been any changes to the uh, to the preliminary budget since then. Um, I just might bring your, also your attention that the, uh, um, we are still anticipating that even though there might be a special session coming up that we will not be, we're not anticipating them making any changes to the, 2020 or the 2021 school year at this point. Um, I think we have also factored in um, conservatively what could happen beyond that in FY22 and beyond. Um, just 
because we don't we just don't know any more than we do right now so i guess i would uh, recommend that the board uh, approve the um fiscal year 21 preliminary budget um tonight thank you mr rosoric uh are there any you know what let's uh let's do this let's um, there is a recommended action to approve the fiscal year 2021 preliminary budget as presented. Is there a motion to do so? So Mark, moved. Oh, okay. Ms. Doctor, uh, there's been a motion by Dr. Arcan, and I'm assuming a second by Dr. Newmaster. Yes. All right. Is there uh, any discussion regarding the budget? I know that this has been in our pack. I know that we've discussed it several times. Uh, I just want to make sure because I know that with technology, it's a little bit hard to get off mute. Uh, so I wanted to make sure just to wait a couple more seconds if there's any questions. Um, Chair Mullen. See, Dr. Arcan. So I, I think it's important that we understand moving forward that we made the best decision we could with the data that we have. And I know that we try to be very conservative and just as if we could not anticipate, if we did not anticipate the pandemic that occurred, um, we have to understand that as things occur, we'll adjust us as we move forward. And so we're putting our best attempt forward today, and then we can expect adjustments to, to come as things change in the economy and our funding streams and things like that. May I add, may I add to that? Um, so, Dr. Arcand, I, I, I think that's a um, that's accurate. I, I think that's a, a typical budgeting process. Is a preliminary budget is just that, and there are always adjustments. I think the adjustments mid-year this year might be more significant than what we're used to seeing. Um, so, I would um, I would echo that that statement. So, Dr. Arcand, Dr. Kazrachek, thank you both for your comments. Did you have anything else, Dr. Kazrachek? No. Are there any other questions regarding the presented budget? Hearing or seeing none, uh, this will require a roll call vote, but ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thompson? Aye. Arkin. Aye. Chapman? Aye. Ellison? Aye. Mullen? Aye. Newmaster? Aye. Okay, the budget has been approved. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now move into our Next operational item, uh, E6, which is the action on the uh, purchase of property. Dr. Kazmierczak. Right, thank you, Chair Mullen, members of the board. <clears throat> so before you tonight are two more properties that, uh, again, fit into the planning of, of the uh, North Campus uh, addition, the, high, the new high school. And um, you've received information about these properties. And, and again, as we've talked, uh, at other other times, these are consistent with the, the plan, um, and these um, these two properties again are willing willing sellers and are um, um, and so we're presenting those to you tonight for approval. And uh, Mr. Mullen, I'd be happy to read the recommendation if you prefer. Or... Uh, I've got it in front okay. of me, but if you want, if you feel uh, duty to do so, please go okay. ahead and read it. Okay, I was trying to lighten your load tonight. There's been a lot of agenda items. Um, All good. All right, so the recommended action is that we would move to approve the two purchase agreements for the properties described as PID number 113-022-430-020 and PID number 143-022-120008, located in the city of White Bear Lake, Ram uh, County of Ramsey, state of Minnesota. The board authorizes the superintendent and the assistant superintendent for finance and operations to sign all documents as necessary to acquire said properties. You've heard the recommended action. Is there a motion to do so? So moved. A motion by I'll, Mr. Chapman. Is there a second? I'll second. A second by Ms. Thompson. Is there any discussion regarding the recommended action? Hearing or seeing none, this will require a roll call vote. Would ask the clerk to please please call the roll. Thompson? Aye. Arcan? Aye. Chapman? Aye. Ellison? Aye. Mullen? 
Aye. New master. Aye. All right. Uh, the motion passes. Thank you all very much. We will now move into our last operational item, uh, E7. I uh, will take these, all the, these are several policies coming before us for our second reading. I will take them in one fell swoop. Um, so I will read all of them. Uh, the second reading of school board policy 415, uh, mandated uh, reporting of maltreatment of vulnerable adults, policy 535, service animals on school property, policy 604, uh, instructional curriculum, uh, policy 624, online learning options, policy 806, crisis management uh, policy. Is there a motion to adopt these policies? So moved. Other uh, by Ms. Thompson. New master, sorry, my earbuds just uh, ran out of juice. Uh, there's been a motion and a second by Dr. Newmaster. Is that correct? It was a tie, so however you call it is fine. All right, so there's been a motion and a second. Any discussion regarding uh, said policies? Chair Mullen, I, I have a, uh, would like to be recognized with regard to this. Mr. Chapman. Okay, uh, Dr. Kazmierczak, you and I, uh, as you know, had that uh, conversation earlier today. This has to do with policy number 535, service animals on school property. And I, I believe you're still looking into it. The question that I had for the rest of the board um, is the, um, the policy as it's stated talks about school property and the discussion that occurred, uh, as I recall, around the time of the policy committee meeting is that uh, the term school property would be encompassing of school vehicles, such as uh, district-owned school buses and, and uh, vehicles and so forth, uh, where the animals would be allowed uh, on them. Uh, the question that I had uh, has to do with uh, non-owned school vehicles, such as those by first student or the uh, other transportation uh, firms, vendors that we are utilizing, um, if there, if this policy needs to be uh, changed to reflect uh, somehow that uh, uh, where it's formalized that those animals would be allowed on those vendor-owned vehicles as well. Yeah, and so I did have a conversation with Mr. Lano, and he, he was not able to participate tonight. He had technology difficulties, but we had, I, I explained to him what your concern was, and he, um, we talked about policy, district policies applying to, um, you know, when we, when we um, um, contract with vendors, our, the district policies apply. And then he, he also was going to do some uh, looking into different examples of what that he could have provided um, of where, uh, you know, if a service animal did, did something to another student on a, on a, on a vendor's bus, for example, um, could that be problematic for us? And so he was, he was actually going to uh, have a couple scenarios for us tonight, but, I, but he wasn't able to participate. So... He didn't. He didn't raise a huge alarm, but but he uh, he appreciated the question, and he was going to do a little digging on that. So, I think if you, yeah, if I was you just, comfortable, I mean, moving ahead, are you comfortable moving ahead, or would you prefer to just pull it off until you we can have further discussion about it? I think we could move ahead on it. it yeah. It's just something to and probably then, keep in mind relative for the future, relative to uh, having you know, that policy perhaps reflect that going forward at some point. Um, maybe it doesn't need to, but just to keep it in mind for uh, for further consideration. Sounds good. And then I will still follow up with them and follow up with you again. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. Thank you, Dr. Kazmierczak. Are there any other questions regarding uh, said policies? Ms. Chair Thompson. Mullen, could I be recognized? Yes, Ms. Thompson. Um, I have a couple. Uh, policy 604 in regards to curriculum. 
um, at the end where it gets into the legal references. If there's one that doesn't, if we provide curriculum on it, but it's highlighted and it is Minnesota Statute 120B.234 Child Sexual Abuse Prevention Education. I see that it's highlighted, but there's no mention of what sort of curriculum we provide in that manner. Dr. Kaczynski, I can answer that question. Yep. Yeah. Um, thank you, Chair Mullen. Um, very good question. We actually asked the same question. That was a recommendation from MSBA. Um, we did not see anything that connected to that within the policy. Um, Jody did check into that, and it was just that there was some language change um, in MS um, in the at the legislative level, but there was nothing relevant in the policy. So it's a signal that something may come in the future, but there is nothing in the policy yet that is correlated with um, with that reference to the policy. So thank you for asking that question. We we delayed this one for that exact reason, um, and and we did not get an answer other than good question. So. Thanks for asking. Thank you, Ms. Paul, for answering. I think it's a good a good thing that hopefully we will have something coming in the future. I think that's a great preventative measure we can um, hopefully someday include into our curriculum. Um, I also had a question on a couple questions that get into policy 806. Oh, bear with me while I get down there. Um, 806 is um, the one for crisis management policy. Uh, my first question is in uh, section two, B as in boy, uh, 1A. Um, in there, it says uh, in the second or the third sentence, lockdown causes classroom security to protect students and staff from a threat. And I was just wondering what classroom security um, is or equals, um, if somebody could define that for me. So that would be like the locking mechanism that uh, you might have, for example, or shades in a window that a room might have or location within a room go to just a general a general statement on uh, what is used in a particular room for security okay thank you i just wasn't sure if there was some something i wasn't sure that we had um and then the next one is uh more of i think maybe might have been missing language and i gotta get there it is in uh, the same area, but it is down in three, uh, three A. Um, in the top part there, it says that we are selecting a building emergency response team. And then down below, um, let me see if I find my, for the purpose of student safety and accountability to the extent possible, school emergency response team members will not have direct responsibility. So that school be uh, building emergency response team members to reflect the first part. Angela, could you tell me where you are? Which, which item? So I'm in, I'm in, um, that same section, which is what section two, okay, and then um, number three, letter A. In the beginning, we called it BERT, Building Emergency Response Team, and then if you go down um, past the highlighted portion, that next sentence starts with for the purposes of student safety and accountability to the extent possible school emergency response team members. I just wonder if that word school should be building. Oh, okay. 
it's just a I had it, so I thought if if we're gonna make changes, that maybe we could. We yeah. We, uh, it's yeah, a silly one, but I noticed it. Ms. Thompson, are there do you have any other questions? I do. I'm sorry. I have two more. We certainly could um, make that change. I um, would want to be. I'll just take a look to, and make sure it's consistent within within that particular item, though. Okay. But, okay. Yeah. My next one is just a question in section three, um, A number two. We have um, created the crisis management policy. Um, and then it looks like we tailor plans for each individual school building. I just wonder why we don't have an overall district policy that each building would follow. Is it my understanding that we will have like an, maybe a, a policy that they can follow and then each building can tailor that specific to their building needs that's right so we do have a we do have an overall plan that then gets tailored depending on the building so okay uh, perfect yeah, uh, yeah there are different our buildings are very different how they operate so the their planning has to reflect that but there is an overarching uh, district plan great thank you uh, my last one comes because back um, when I took part in my group for um, I, um, my brain is starting to not work anymore. Uh, when we did, um, all right, I'm sorry. I'll just skip past that. It's actually in letter E and it's the warning system. Um, so when I worked with my team on the, um, oh, I'm sorry. I cannot think of the word right now. My, uh, we talked, we had a member in our team who was, uh, deaf, and they were a teacher in the district. They are no longer a teacher in the district, but one of their concerns, and then a couple of the other members on our team had also had the concern. Um, I believe one of the parents had a child who was hard of hearing, and so I'm just wondering if there's a way we have, if we have thought about how our warning systems um, warn people who are hard of hearing or maybe blind. Um, one concern was if the student was in the bathroom or the, even the teacher was in the bathroom, when the warning is going off, there's no way for them to know. They wouldn't possibly see people, you know, um, reacting to the alarm going off. And I know other um, buildings and different companies and districts have like a light system where it you know, a, a certain color red would be warning, um, or I, I'm not sure how you would do it, but I just wonder if that's something we're thinking about as we're building and kind of doing this stuff um, in the schools. And I hadn't thought of it until I read this uh, in here tonight. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if you have, but you can add anything, I'll, I'll, I'll answer it. And then if you have anything else to add about um, any of the scrolls that we do. So yeah, strobes are used in, um, in emergencies and in, in buildings, and I, I can't speak to exactly how wide how wide they were using that, but that is a technology that we are we're talking about um, improving our security systems, including the, those types of things in our buildings. And so I don't know, do you have anything to add there? I, I can add something. This is Lisa Oren. Um, oftentimes, the students um, who have those disabilities, we're working through their IT teams to come up with plans on how best to support them through all those different scenarios that you mentioned. So it's done in planning with their IEP team. Correct. Great. Thank, thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. I just want to also remind board members, too, that uh, the policies are uh, in the board packets for two months. And at any point, uh, as you're working through your board packet or from the previous month, uh, if you have questions or concern, I would encourage you to email them also to Dr. Kazmichek, uh too, so we can make sure that we're make it, getting the correct, getting it good answers uh, for those questions. Sometimes when you're doing it here at night, it's a little bit uh, harder to, uh, 
uh, come up with the answer right away when if you can if you need to do a little bit of research, it can be done. So just wanted to make that statement. Appreciate everybody answering uh, the questions and and the follow up. Um, are there any other questions regarding uh, said policies? Hearing or seeing none, uh, this will require a roll call vote. Would ask the clerk to please read the roll. Thompson. Aye. Arcan. Aye. Chapman. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Mullen. Aye. Newmaster. Aye. Thank you all. Those policies uh, have been approved. Uh, we are now at the portion of our meeting uh, is board forum. Uh, would open it up uh, if there's any board members that have anything to report back on or they would like to address anything. Uh, this would be a great time to do so. So are there anything under board forum? Dr. Newmaster. I would just like to congratulate again all of our retirees in all the areas that people have worked for us for many, many years. But I'd like especially to mention someone who's kind of invisible sometimes to most of the world, but Gene Rasmussen has solved all kinds of snarly problems for us over the years with software and technology and had endless patience. And I know everybody's going to really miss her. She helped me a lot when I was a media specialist, but she has many expertise areas that have helped lots of us. So thank you, Jean. Best wishes and best wishes to everybody else for a safe summer. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Newmaster. Are there anything else under board forum? Chair Mullen, if I could. Ms. Elson. I just wanted to commend leadership um, and all of the staff for a tremendous job the past couple of months. It's been so weird and difficult and challenging and from what I have seen, leadership has worked really hard to make this happen. And with a, my parent hat, I would not be prouder to be a bear. Uh, I also want to thank Sarah Paul for her service to the district and wish her the best of luck. All right. Thank you, Ms. Allison. Is there anything else under board forum? Chair Mullen. Uh, if I could be recognized. Yes, yep. sir. And yeah, I uh, just want to echo that. Uh, as far as uh, Sarah Paul, I uh, uh, have enjoyed working with her and look forward to uh, hearing how things are going in, in North Branch. Uh, wish her the best there. And uh, one other item uh, that I want to mention too is, uh, I don't know how many of the board members had noticed, but uh, COVID-19 took one of our uh, colleagues, uh, the board chair of uh, the St. Paul School District, I noticed today had passed away yesterday uh, at the age of 31 from COVID-19. So um, clearly what we are doing to try to social distance and and all of the different measures to keep people safe um, is, it just brings it back to light and, and uh, hits home that uh, those measures are needed and have been needed and, and uh, we're gonna have to uh, work through it all uh, to try and get back to some form of normalcy. But nonetheless, um, uh, I just uh, feel very bad for, for that, uh, for her family. I guess her name was Marnie Zong, Zong? and uh, for the St. Paul uh, community. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. Chair Zhang was a, a great leader and a fierce advocate for education. Um, I've worked with her on many occasions and uh, thank you very much for your comments. Is there anybody else that has anything under board forum? I just wanna end by saying that uh, congratulations to all of our seniors um, kind of bittersweet for myself and I'm sure Mr. Chapman, uh, but I uh, want to just, and I want to thank the staff for their work on putting together the uh, graduation, uh, virtual graduation. They did a tremendous job. I thought it was very well put together and I uh, just want to thank them for their work. Um, and if there's nothing else, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Chair Mullen. I make the motion to adjourn. Uh, we have a motion, 
Is there a second? Second. A se we have a motion by Dr. Arcan, a second by Mr. Chapman. Uh, this will require a roll call vote. Would the clerk please read the roll? Thompson? Aye. Arcan? Aye. Chapman? Aye. Ellison? Aye. Mullen? Aye. Newmaster? Aye. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Be safe. Thank, Thank you. you. Go Bears. Go Bears. All right.